on air. We're live and on air. So it did work. I was just saying we are we are starting the the Google Hangout once again. And with Google, you know, you just never know. We're at its mercy. And um, but I guess we should always be grateful that we have this type of technology that brings us together and allows us to share content. <laughs> and like you mentioned a little bit ago, Clark, you know, we get our money's worth, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> so yep, it, you know. You, Every once in a while there's hiccups, but I mean it's pretty amazing for us to be chatting face to face across the many states and right. you know for free. So that's free. pretty cool. I know. So we can't we can't complain too harshly when little glitches happen and things don't go the way we think they should. But we're going to get started because we have a lot to cover. And Clark, um, you know I've known you. I'm trying to think of how many years I've known you. Just in the L and D kind of arena, mostly online, and then we met at conferences. Um, but how long have you been in the learning environment? How long have you been in this space? <laughs> uh, learning and technology, I've been in for over thirty-five years. Wow! So since the I was, uh, child prodigy, no, yeah. um, <laughs> I <started> connecting <laughs> between computers and learning as an undergraduate, and uh, I ended up designing my own major, and it's been my career ever since and my passion and what I love so which is ironic with the topic that we're going to talk about today because you have been in this learning and development space for so long and you wrote a book called the learning and development revolution and you're really on this mission to help change the way organizations do learning is that right well Indeed, it is because you know my first job out of college was designing and programming educational computer games, and uh, I realized that we didn't understand enough about how we think and learn to design them well. So I went back to get you know a PhD in what was effectively applied cognitive science, and since then I've been you know geeky about how do we learn. That's my passion, and and how can we then leverage technology? You know, I'm a boy and I like toys. I like shiny objects, and so. I've always been looking at how do we meld these together and for a long story I came sort of out of the academic world into the corporate world thinking oh we have the resources to do it well and I looked at what they're doing and I go oh okay and this was over a decade ago and I, <laughs> nothing's really changed. That is we interesting Clark because first of all I think that's what drew us together years ago when we first met is just the love of shiny objects and technology and kind of diving in and exploring different ways to use tools for learning and you know I always say we're in this kind of digital disruption phase where businesses are really struggling with trying to figure out how do we survive in this new digital world and what does it mean to us and how does it apply to us why do you think because I'm always thinking the learning environment is on the forefront typically you would think that but why do you think that is not the case um, because it, it's also not the case outside of technology so you look at corporate learning the training events by and large they are based upon an industrial model going back to you know the, how we when we turn schools into factories for <laughs> to produce workers for factories right and we, really care about success we were just we were happy to filter through the ones that would you know could learn in that way and and succeed despite schooling and we really haven't gotten rid of that you know the corporate executives go well I went to school I know what learning should look like and um, L&D folks go well this is cost effective and nobody's and nobody's measuring whether it's actually effective they're seeing that it's efficient but nobody's measuring whether there's any effectiveness and so I think it's easy to delude ourselves that what we're doing is what we've always done without noticing that it's worthless. Yeah, which which the sad thing is, like you said, for ten for over ten years, we it's I feel like we've been talking the same talk, singing the same song. You go to every conference and they talk about we need to change the way things are done and we need to make these drastic changes and people no longer learn the same way and what do you think are some of the major shifts or changes that need to be done in the L&D space? 
Well, you know, so yeah, it, it's. Besides exploding. I realize the, the technology has changed, but the underlying models haven't changed. And so, what we need to do is get back to the underlying models. And so, what I was just saying, one of the first things is start measuring what we're doing in meaningful impacts, not how long, how much does it cost per bum, per seat, per hour. <laughs> but, um, you know, are we change, increasing sales, decreasing time to uh, reduce, you know, solve customer problems? Are we actually increasing customer satisfaction? We've got to measure the right things. And then we have to go back and look at how we really learn. The notion that knowledge dump and knowledge test is going to lead to any meaningful change is just barking mad. We need to understand that we need meaningful situated practice. That's why we did the Serious E-Learning Manifesto. You know, four of us were just so frustrated like you and I are expressing here. And we decided we at least try and put a stake in the ground and say, hey, this is what good learning really looks like. And this flows over into informal learning and innovation and a whole bunch of areas that organizations need and L&D could be facilitating. So I have this short mantra that says, what L&D is doing is not near what it could and should be doing, and what it is doing is doing badly. <laughs> and, <we've got> to... <laughs> so and on we're... that happy note, here's what we need to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that is it's interesting because you kind of look at it and go, okay, it seems very logical. Okay, we need to measure what's working, what's not. What are the results that you're getting from your learning now? And and then identifying and I think maybe this is where the helplessness comes in is people feel like I don't know what to do different. And then do I have the support to do it differently? Mm -hmm. that, do you think that's one of the big challenges? Um, it is because you know the existing structures are put in place and comfortable and and well tested. And people, you know, they don't resist change. That turns out to be a, a myth. People make changes all the time. They change jobs. They decide to get married. I mean, there's a change for you. Um, but um, they choose the change. And when we try and force change upon people, I heard a very uh, clever guy named Peter De Jager talk about change, and he said, you know give them the choice and say, well, we can do it this old way that doesn't work, or we can do it this new way. But it, it's, you know, there's a lot of factors. And, you know, the tools are aligned to doing this old stuff. You know, the, the market has come to serve it and has a vested interest in self-perpetuation rather than have to invest money to support change as well. A lot of factors mitigating against the change we need. So we need to, you know, that's why I'm a little bit, almost strident in the book people have accused me of, you know said either thank you for not you know holding any pulling any punches or <laughs> you're pretty much in their face aren't you <laughs> well I think it is it's frustrating I, I always say it's it's exhausting being an evangelist after a while and you know you you try and preach it and try to convince people the need to change and when you still see people resisting it's exhausting and so I think part of that's probably where that comes from from your you feel in that same way but I look at it I'm trying to understand like okay why if you're in this L&D space what where is this coming from this resistance and then I thought okay the reality is it's easy to come to work and keep doing things the same way because you still get paid to do it and if people aren't measuring the results uh, they check it off the list they went through training check they you know so then you say okay how do you how do you convince people that we need to do it different? We need to, and there's going to be work involved, and yes, there's going to be costs involved. So I could see the reality of why it's easy to do things the way we've been doing it for 20 years. But yeah, you know, you're saying some of the steps: identify or how you met, you know, how you're able to measure that, and that might be a huge undertaking all on its own. Is how do you measure the right things and going about that, and then. Are there other steps that you feel that you've identified that people can take? What are some of the other things that we should be doing? Well, it, it, in parallel, several things. So um, measuring is one and, and getting strategic and saying, you know, we're, we're going to have to, one of the reasons we haven't gone into measurement is because we don't own the measures that we need to be impacting. We need to be in more of a partnership with the business unit. You know, when they and right now they come and say, I need a course on X, and we don't go back and challenge, is that really the problem? So we need to move to performance consulting. Um, and we need to work with their measures, not our measures. So that, that's a challenge, but we need to do that. So we need to start focusing on not offering courses, but saying, what's going to make a difference? Sometimes it doesn't have to be in the head. It's really hard to get stuff in our head. Our, you know, and so we should save that for when it's really needed. And instead, can we put information in the world? Can we, you know? 
you're not going to remember 500 different router configurations. You look it up. Let's make sure we make it easy to look it up. Um, and, and on and on. And then, you know, what's going to make a difference to organizations is not just optimal execution. That's only going to be the cost to entry. The, the real differentiator is going to be continual innovation. What can L&D do there? It turns out a lot. People go, oh, I don't know. No, there's a lot. People aren't necessarily good innovators, don't know how to work and play well together. We can be facilitating that innovation by, you know, and you're a guru of social media, you know the power we can get out of people interacting together, and the myth of individual innovation is busted. It's not, you know, one person goes away and comes back with a genius. It's, it's evolution on people's thoughts and creative friction, and we can facilitate that. And we should, so we need to start looking, and this is a continuum from formal learning through performance support out to social interaction and informal learning, and look at that as a coherent whole, align our strategy for it, align our culture for it, and develop an infrastructure to support it, and then be facilitators. That, which is interesting when you say the whole thing of consultative and, and being facilitators, and even within your own company, it's not just here's a laundry list of courses we offer within our company. It's really challenging that thinking of no more laundry lists of, of just generic courses. It's what are we really trying to accomplish and what change are we trying to, to make within this organization. Um, I'm curious because typically we think of large organizations are harder to see change happen and, and we always think small organizations are nimble. I'm, I'm curious on your thoughts because I'm thinking out loud here. It's interesting when I talk to people within a small organization they get stuck in, there's one person that's the L&D department, you know, it's like there's one person who doesn't have time to think outside and get creative and then, you know, so they're trying to, but yet they seem to be more networked on social media within, or you know, different um, groups online to look for resources. Large organizations, they tend to have a group of people who could be brainstorming and be more innovative together but maybe harder to get buy-in to change. Have you seen um, anything in that? Is there something to large company versus small companies? Um, you know, yes and, and no. You know, the mindset shouldn't be different to how you may have to navigate it. The interesting thing is you'd think that the large company L&D would be more innovative. Right. But when you look at the data, what ASTD reports about, you know, the penetration of social media into l and it's, it's like less than 30%. It's amazing that they are not the ones who are experimenting and trying stuff out to figure out how they can bring that to their people. Right. Um, and it's, again, just that factory model, and they're measuring the wrong thing, so they're measuring how efficient they are at producing courses, which leads to courses that are very efficient and completely ineffective. Right. Um, but they're easy. <laughs> And, and, you know, the, the independent um, person really faces the same challenges because unless they can manage up and educate their customers, so there are a few people, I think of Mark Britz, who's trying to, you know, was tasked with creating a corporate university. That was what he was brought on for, and his notion of a computer, of a corporate university was a social network, and he managed to sell that for a while, and, and um, has been fighting that, and so that's a case study. But And so an individual can... In, has the opportunity to be more of an agent of change because, you know, <laughs> except for their manager, they can manage up and make it uh, of their own initiative. But it's, um, I, I think larger companies find it more difficult to change unless somebody high up in the hierarchy says, we will change. Yeah. Yeah. And again, most people, well, I think it's just easy to come in and keep things going the way they are, but you would think right now in this time period of we have to really look at every single aspect of business to say uh, it's, it's change or die. I mean, you're seeing companies go under that you never thought would go under because they're not nimble and they're not willing to change or just look at things. Is this effective? Um, so if I'm someone in this, and, I, and I'm listening, whether I work for an organization, a large team, or whether I work alone and, and struggle with this, if I'm listening to this Hangout, Clark, number one, I should get your book, <laughs> which, <laughs> which, by the way, we're going to be giving away, iSpring is going to be giving away one of the books, um, which a lot of people say, wait, Gina, do you work for iSpring? We actually do the marketing for iSpring, and I love this space, and so, um, and because I know you and I'm fascinated by your topics, I, I got to uh, do this hangout today, but um, 
yeah, so that's that's kind of the tie-in with why I'm at iSpring doing this, and and iSpring, of course, is um, hosting these this leadership series that we've been doing. But um, we're going to be giving away one of the books, and we're going to have people share some ideas. We're going to get innovative together. So look for that. We're going to be posting um, starting today questions and getting people to share. So we're going to be giving away one of your books. But aside from getting that book, because there's a lot of great information in there. What are, if you had to take away like three nuggets to say, here's something you can do. I mean, I don't know if it's like we're repeating ourselves of measurement, but are there things that today I can tangibly write down and say, this is my to-do list for next week. Let's give you the break. You're going to take a long holiday. So on Tuesday, um, if, if I work at L&D, what can I do, action items, starting next week? Um, so there's there's several connected things, and the the difficulty is there's something in each area. So there's more than just a, a couple things. So get your pens ready. I guess your couple things could be look at each area and figure out which one you're going to address first. The, the the step path forward for any one organization isn't going to be the same as any one other organization. It depends on where they already at. You know, some have some social networks. You know, just briefly, the threat you were, you know, you were saying that organizations aren't nimble. A lot of the efforts to get around that, to start bringing in enterprise social networks, to be using performance support, are going to come from out, are already coming outside L&D, and unless L&D gets involved, they're, they're on a path to extinction. So what do you do? Um, you know, the first thing is, is stop accepting requests for courses. Start being a performance consultant, saying, wait, what's the real problem? Is this that they just can't find the information, but it's there? Does it really have to be in the head? And resist that, you know. And the second thing is, is, and is could it be coming from the network, our internal network? If somebody has the answer, we shouldn't be trying to do it all. So a, a minimalist mindset. I have this uh, mantra I call the least assistance principle. Um, what's the least I can do for you is not a rude answer. <laughs> that is, you're right, though. <laughs> People don't want everything. They just want enough to get back to the task if you set up the right culture. You just have to word it differently. <laughs> so, well, it, yeah. It, it really isn't people don't want everything. So you need to start going minimalist and saying, what's the least I can do to get people going back? Um, and that includes, if the answer's in the network, I don't have to create a course on it. Resist creating courses. Look for the easiest way to get work, to get people functional, whether it's a job aid or just connecting to the right person. I know there's a small social media company here in the Bay Area that you know says, we're not creating courses for anything but our own culture. Everything else, there's a book for, you know, you have a problem with X, there's the book you should read on it. You know, you want to know about this? Here, go watch this video. We're not creating it. That's, <laughs> That's a great point. Know. There's so much out there already that mm -hmm. most people think, oh, we need to create our own project management course. We need to create our own time management course. We need, and it's already out there. So focus on something that's more cool. A colleague just resisted a client who wanted them to create a, an ergonomics course. It's like, they exist. You don't need to create yet your own. There's nothing unique about your company. <laughs> your chair is the same as theirs. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, so it, it, um, we're doing too much because that's what we know how to do instead of being willing to stretch our boundaries. And yet being learning folks, we should be continually learning. Anyway, so getting the... the Getting the culture, getting the strategy, and beginning to measure are probably the three biggest things you should be looking at. And I realize culture change is hard in L and D, but it really, the elements that lead to the most effective organizations are cultural, and they're about creating a learning organization where people are sharing. It's safe to share. Where you can um, diversity isn't just tolerated; it's valued where you definitely want to look at new ideas where you can experiment and fail and that's okay as long you know I heard this lovely story I always love to tell the story small company rang a bell not when the mistake was made but when the lesson was learned oh. and sh sharing the lesson means nobody else has to make the same mistake but it was okay to make mistakes because you could learn from it just never make the same mistake again right but by sharing it by ringing the bell by celebrating the lesson you were sharing it and it was less likely Somebody else would make the same one, and that's. Love that. That's a great story. Yeah. 
Is yeah, and it's and, and I don't know how you start that within a culture if it's not started from the top. I mean, it has to be. You have to encourage it. You have to celebrate it. You you do have to reward that innovative thinking, that going out and trying something different. And I I just think that's a hard thing because usually again we know that we should do that from the bottom. I mean, we we kind of we sense that we should do that, but unless it's starting from the top and really enforced and celebrated, it's a hard one to move. Well, yeah, L&D should be doing it internally, just walking the walk, right. but absolutely, at the end of the day, the leadership needs to not just be paying lip service to it, but doing it themselves. They need to start, you know, blogging and tweeting and sharing their thinking, even just internally, but by sharing thinking is such a powerful thing. You know, Jane Bozar's new book, Show Your Work, is, is just so apt. You know, Harold Jarkey's been talking about it. It is working out loud, um, and, you know, work and learning are merging, and if the leadership makes it safe to sh fail by modeling it, you really are going to have a powerful uh, impetus to change. Yeah, which is great. And the whole concept of starting the, sh the sharing and the social learning together within an organization, do you have any suggestions on ways that companies who are not doing any of that can start? I mean, blogging, uh, I think of as a natural one. Seems like that's right. Something. Well, absolutely. I think put, one of the first steps is putting an enterprise social network in there. And one of the lessons is you put it in and nobody shares, you've got a clue that your culture is in, right? right. That's some, a message you can carry forward. Um, so then figuring out how to make it work rather than abandoning it um, is, is, is critical. And so you're going to have to manage up and get the buy-in. When you sell the the notion of we're going to put in this enterprise social network, you got to sell the values that go with it. And I think one one thing coming from an outside perspective, when I'm always encouraging people to blog and share your knowledge and get that out of there and quit being knowledge hoarders, is people will start a blog and they expect participation immediately. Just like in marketing, people start social media or they start blogging and they expect people to walk in the door and want to buy things immediately make sure when you're within an organization and you're starting an internal blog or a, a, a tool that you're going to use to share, be patient. Because I always tell people, start, be consistent, but also be patient because it's going to take a while for people to start seeing, oh, there's some valuable information here. Or maybe you're asking people if they can participate and you're getting, you know, it's like pulling teeth to get them to do that. But be patient and keep being consistent and I think it'll pay off. Well, indeed, Mark Ayler talks about you know paving the the deer paths. Um, you know, they put in a building, and you'll put in these fancy sidewalks and then and grass elsewhere, and you'll see dirt paths through the grass because that's where the people actually walk. And if you waited to build the sidewalk till you saw where they walked, you'd find out where you should pave. And so, <laughs> what he means by that is go to communities that are already working, and then you bring the technology with there, get that working well. And I use a, a agricultural metaphor. So you need to seed the network, and uh, you need to feed it, and you have to nurture it. It doesn't happen by, you know, if you build it, they will not come. You need to right. And then you need to weed out those ineffective behaviors where people are being trolls or nasty or stuff and sort of subtly get the behavior set. And then once you've, you know, seeded and feed it and weed it, you know, Dave Ferguson was the one who said, then you can breed it. Then you can and breed it. Carry that elsewhere. That's that scaling of excellence model, you know. And Nancy White has talked about that it can take as long as 18 months. She's found enough for profits for this, for networks to get to this critical mass where they're self-sustaining. And everybody worries. And you know this stuff as as well as anybody. I think you know, is that you know, people worry. Oh gosh, what if they say inappropriate things? Well, these networks become self-correcting. But up until that point, you will have to be active. You will have to nurture, and it will take time. Absolutely. Yeah, you're there every day, and I always say people are going to talk whether it's on your internal site or not. They're they're going to post this. They're griping about it in the break rooms, or they're you know they're writing about it on their own personal blogs outside, or writing about it on on uh, Facebook or wherever about your organization. So make it a safe place for people to. Uh, but you correct it, and you're there managing it and pulling things. You know, talking to people one on one. But but I think that's interesting. The 18 months. I I would agree. I think it takes over a year before you really start seeing it just take off on its own where you can now, not that you have to abandon it, but it will be self-policing and you're just now just checking up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so uh, that's the, you know, the other strategy. Besides being a performance consultant, being that sort of 
interaction facilitator is the complementary role, and those two things together are the mind shifts that I think we're, we're trying to facilitate here. This is fascinating, and it's never enough time to cover everything that I wish we could cover. And um, But these are really great tangible things we can start doing right away within organizations that we can start really, um, I, like I say, we almost need to shake the organizations and say um, it's no longer acceptable to do things the way that we've been doing and let's let's create change right starting in the L&D um, groups. If, they, if people want to find out more information, obviously you're everywhere. If you just Google Clark Quinn, um, which you know for the longest time I, I thought your last name had to have been Quinnovator, but on <laughs> Twitter on Twitter I know you're at Quinnovator, but mm -hmm. where, what is your website that people can find more information about you and about your book? Okay, several places. Well, quinnovation.com is me, um, so uh, that's where you can find me. There is a site for the book, revolutionizeLND.com. Uh, you can find out about the book. There's a LinkedIn group, uh, the Revolutionize LND group, um, and I'll be running a workshop at a uh, strategy workshop based on this at DevLearn in uh, end of October in in Las Vegas of all places. Uh, lots of people love it. It's not quite my cup of tea, but I'll be there. <laughs> so those are just several resources you can go to to find out what's going on. Awesome. And we'll put those resources in the description here on the video because this will be loaded up to YouTube. Um, it probably within the hour it gets loaded up there and then I'll put all of these in the in the show notes in the description area and I'll send you the link so you can pass that around as well. But yeah. um, definitely um, I'm excited to just hear the success stories and I'm hoping that people will share challenges, questions, success stories just so we can see this whole revolution kind of get started. Well, that's we practicing what we preach. <laughs> we can't assume we're going to do it best all by ourselves. We're going to together we're going to come up with a better solution than any of us would have on our own. And uh, uh, I really think the opportunity to promote, you know, to try and get this dialogue going because I think it's really important and thank you for the opportunity. Oh, we're, we're thrilled that you were able to, to be on here and is the LinkedIn group open? Yeah. Okay, so that's a, another great place to get in there and, and find ideas, share ideas and learn from each other as well. So everyone needs to, to um, start the revolution. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank Up the revolution. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> because, oh, I guess we have to hold our phones up. <laughs> All right. There I we love go. that graphic. Uh, <laughs> thanks so much, Clark. Thank you, Gina. Appreciate it. Bye. Bye-bye.